book in the Bible in the very first verse. <laughs> in the presence of God's plan. No, not presence, in the process. <laughs> in the process of God's plan. In the process of God's plan. And so I want to read, first of all, Genesis 1, 1. This is a familiar one that you know by heart. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You know, it's interesting the way that, that the Bible starts. The Bible doesn't try to prove the existence of God. It just states that he is God. In the beginning, God. And part of what God did in the beginning, in, in the beginning as far as we know, and for the earth, and that's where we're at. That's our part. In the beginning, God, part of that beginning, he created the heaven and earth. God always existed, so he's, he was before that. But as far as what we know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then if you go all the way to the last book in the Bible, in Gen uh, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So we read in Genesis 1, 1, that in the beginning, God, in Revelation, we find out that in between Genesis and Revelations, there's God. In between that time, there is the history of mankind and the world that we know it. Now, there's been a lot of things said about what happened before Genesis 1-1, what, <clears throat> you know, what went on, what was before that. I don't really care. <laughs> I don't really care. That's God. That's up to God. What God did before he created this world that we have, that was his business, and he did what he wanted to in that time frame. But we're talking about where we're at tonight. And so, so before Genesis 1, 1, there was God. And when all is done after the end of Revelation and time is more, no more, it's with God. What God does then, that's with God. We're not going to try to guess what happens because we don't know what's going to happen exactly. We know where we're going to end up, who we're going to be with. We're going to be with the Lord in the new Jerusalem and, and so on. We'll know that. But we don't know all that we're going to be doing and all that will go on after that, what God will do after that, because God always was, always will be, and he may choose to, who, who knows what to do after that. That's God's business. That's not us for try to figure out. But what we're concerned about is our place in history, where we live right now, our place in the scope and plan of God. God's the one that created man, and he's the one that man has to give an account to. So one day we're going to stand before the Lord and we will give an account of our life, what we did in our time, in our little speck of time that we lived upon this earth. What did we do with that? How did we live our life and so forth that we're going to give an account for? So that's what we're concerned about. What we need to be concerned about is in the process of God's plan. How can I be what God wants me to be and do what God wants me to do in my time when I'm living, in this little time that I'm living? You see, God or life is all about people filling the place in that process, and we have to look to the Lord. And in that time and that frame that we live in, you know, we have challenges, we have opportunities. Sometimes it'll be with danger, sometimes with less danger. And it didn't matter whether it was Adam or Abraham or Moses or Isaiah or Haggai or the disciples or the early church or whether it was the year 100 or the year 500 or the year 2000 or the year 2023. Our place is to fill that time that we're in, the process of God's plan for us in that time. I want to go to the book of Haggai. It was interesting, a couple of days ago, I was reading in this book with part of my devotion. 
And Haggai had some words to say to the people of his day that he was addressing his words to and gave them some instructions about rebuilding the temple. And so he had some words to say to them, and I think it's quite interesting and quite fitting when we talk about filling our place in the process of God's plan. We'll begin in, in chapter 1, verse 2 says, Thus speaketh the Lord. Well, let's go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead and just start there instead of reading that first verse. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? And it's interesting if you notice in verse number 5, Know therefore, now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now, as we look at this people at this particular time, they were not filling their place in God's plan. Because you see, God had called them back from the land of captivity and they would go back and rebuild the temple of God. They got back there and they started building. And remember, they only got the foundation laid. And there was some opposition, and so they just quit building. And they forgot all about it, and it was a number of years that had gone on between that time and when Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to them about it. And so, so Haggai comes along and he says, Now, you remember that you've not been building my house that you're supposed to. You've been busy about your own things and doing your own things and building your own houses and taking care of yourself, and you've left my house in ruins. So it says, I want you to consider your ways. Now, I really thought about that when I was reading this. It said, consider your ways. Think about it. They had not been filled in that place. So he said, I want you to think about how you've been living. What's been going on in your life since you haven't been filling your place in the process of God's plan? And verse number 6 says, you have sown much. He said, now I want you to think about these years you haven't been building, you haven't been doing your part. He said, I want you to just consider, just think about it now. You've sown much and you bring in little. You eat but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages, and put it into a bag with holes. Now, look in verse 9. You look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man to his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I call for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labors of the hands. And I, as, I, as I read that, he said, now I want you to consider this. I want you to think about how your life has been the last few years. And he, he began to name how, how it had been. And when I thought about that, I thought, you know, could it maybe be that sometimes when we're facing some reversals or things are not going the way that we think they should, could it maybe be because we're not filling our place in the plan of God for us? Not knowing all setbacks are not, not caused by that, but I said, could that be? Because that's what happened here. That's what happened here. So let's go back to verse number 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He says it again. Consider your ways. Think about it. Where you been and all that. So consider what's been going on. You haven't been doing my work. My house has laid waste. You run to your own house and do your own things, and you've neglected me. And so I, you just think about it. Now consider your ways. He said, go up to the mountain now and bring some wood 
and build a house. Get back to doing what is your place to do. Get back to doing what I've called you to do. And he says, if you'll do that, I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. And verse, we'll go to verse, uh, let's go to verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came, and they did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Now look in chapter 2. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all your people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear you not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than all the former, saith the Lord of hosts. In this place will I give peace, saith the Lord. You know, God has always has, had, a, had a remnant that would be dedicated to him and living for him, carrying out the work of God as the best they could do under the conditions that they were in at the time. And in the Old Testament, the prophets brought orders and direction from God to the people. Today, we have the written word to give us guidance of to do the work of God. Now, with some in this setting here, as he wrote to them, there were some in that time when, you know, when the first temple was built, Solomon's temple, and all of its great beauty. And, of course, it had been torn down, and they had been going back to rebuild. And others now that were living in this time with Haggai, when they built this, this temple was not near as magnificent and as beautiful as the other temple was. But they were still fulfilling the will of God. They were still fulfilling. That was the important thing. They were fulfilling the will of God and what God had for them. And so they were willing to rebuild this house for the name of the Lord. And, of course, in this case, when there were some that looked on that Solomon's temple and remembered back how beautiful they looked in comparison to this one, and it wasn't near as elaborate, and there might be some that would feel bad. But he said, I don't want you to feel bad because, you know, the, 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 the glory that's going to take place in this temple is going to be greater than even Solomon's temple because this temple they built, the day would come when the Messiah is going to walk into that temple. <laughs> It's going to be visited by Jesus, and he'll come into that temple. So it's going to be greater in that respect. But, but the point is, they were doing what God was calling them to do at that particular time in their life. Now, he had to, he had to kind of point out some things and that was going on, remind them, when you weren't doing my work and I wasn't blessing you, you know, you tried a lot of things and didn't work out very good because you didn't have my blessing on you. You weren't doing the work of God. When we give ourselves to do the work of God, commit ourselves to follow his will and fulfill his plan, he's going to bless that effort. He's going to bless our lives. When we commit ourselves to the things that God desires and his will, 
He will bless our lives if we do that. And so God did this. He just reminds them, the reason you, you, know, you weren't being blessed all that time, you just wasn't fulfilling God's plan. You weren't being obedient until all these things were happening. But he said, I'm going to be with you now. I'm with you now, but you're getting back to building, and the blessings of God will be upon them again. Well, there were some people that would be living, and we think about in our period of time, there would be some people living between the Old and New Testament time, remember? And there, in that period of time, there's very little outward demonstration of the power of God. So there would be people living in that time. There would be people living in the Great Depression that took place in our country. There were some that would be living in great spiritual awakening times that have happened in various places. There would be some living in countries that oppose the gospel. Well, today we live in a troubled world. And the Bible calls it perilous times. Perilous times. But we must not do as the people of Israel did that Haggai spoke about and get caught up so much in living for ourselves and thinking about things that affect us. We've got to continue to realize and follow God's instructions as we march on in the process of God's plan, regardless of what this world does, regardless of what Congress does or doesn't do, regardless of what comes or goes, we've got to keep on, we've got to keep on filling our place in the kingdom of God, regardless of what else goes on in the world. When you go back and you read some of the, the martyrs and you read some of those living in some of those countries, where they oppose the gospel, and yet they go on doing what they can. They can't do as much maybe as in a place where it would be open to spread the gospel, but they do what they can where they're at in their place in the world, in their time frame, fulfilling the process of God's plan that God has for them in that particular occasion. As I shared with you this morning, when we get older, we can't do as much as we used to do. <laughs> But we do what we can. You know, when we were younger, we could do a whole lot more. Had a lot more energy. When we get older, we don't. But wherever we're at, whatever time frame, we must do what we can to fill our place in the process of God's plan. We should take our stand for the right, and we pray. But we continue in the plan of God. We look ahead to the time when God will bring to climax all the things that will complete this present age and world, and, and he sets up his kingdom upon the earth and rules and reigns for a thousand years, and then we have a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem for eternity. It'll be greater than anything that man has ever constructed. No more ups and downs, no more evil versus good, no more rich versus poor, no more wars and rumors of war, no more cruel dictators, no more Hitlers, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're in our place in God's process of his plan. We're living right now in this day in 2023. And we have a plan. God has a plan for us as he has had a plan for his people at any age in the world. So we're not there at the completion of everything yet, but we're on our way. And whatever the conditions around us and in the world, we must be men and women of faith, committed to God's plan, seek to be ob obedient to the instructions that he has for us. And you know what? The Bible gives us the plan. If we'll get into the Bible, we'll find God's plan that he has for us in these days that we live. If we'll just spend time in his word, we can find out what God's plan is for us today. So what are those main instructions? Number one, worship God. We worship God. That's part of the reason we were created, to worship God. And so one of the instructions that we have that we are to cooperate in, part of God's plan that he planned, is that we worship God. So that's one of the things we can do. Number two, we can go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Try to get the word out to everybody. 
He's chosen humans to take the gospel. Now, after the rapture and during the tribulation period, he's still going to use humans. He's going to have 144,000 that are going out and preaching, but he's going to also have angels flying through the air proclaiming the gospel. But today, it's humans. Humans are to take the gospel. And that's why we stress being involved in missions because it's a part of the plan of God. Part of the plan of God. And so until Jesus comes, until we go home to be with him, our place, part of the plan that God has for us is to be mission-minded and to help get the gospel out. However that we can do that. We do it one-on-one. -on -one, we do it locally. We do it worldwide. Wherever we can get the word out. That's our mission. That's our purpose and our plan of God for our lives. And so that's one of the things that we can do. Number three, we are to be the light and the salt of the world. The light and salt. And we're to show forth the life of Jesus by a life of godly substance of character and integrity. The scripture says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But I want us to notice that little verse. Says, it's the way we let it shine that's so important. Let your light so shine. Not just let your light shine, but let it shine in a way that will do some good. Let it so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How we let our light shine will make a difference in what people think about Jesus. We can help people to think more about Jesus or less about Jesus by the way we conduct our lives. So that's why that we need to be really careful how, what we say, how we say it, the things we do and our attitudes and so forth that people see in our lives because we represent Jesus in this world. We will be the light. And so it's important that we do that. So it's a way that we let it shine that makes the difference. Paul said to Timothy, Be thou an example of the, um, of the believer in word, in conduct, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So he said, Timothy, be that example of the believer in all those ways. All your life, all the parts of your life. He said in word, in conduct, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, be an example of the believer. That's part of the plan of God for us. And so we want to do that. And, uh, and then he said, he continued on, he said, Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save yourself and them that hear you. Not only is it going to mean that <coughs> will affect your life, but it's going to affect others because that's the way it is with the light and salt. And again, Paul said, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. And so we are to be the light and the salt. And then fourthly, we must also keep in mind the finish of the process. One day we're going to come to the end one day we're going to face the Lord. One of the day we're going to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account of the deeds that we've done. How did we do in the process of his plan? How did we do? What was the motives? How did we? So we're going to give an account one day at the end of our life. So until then. You know, it really, shouldn't, it, it really shouldn't seem like a chore. It should be an honor and a privilege to be the light and the salt, to be an example and a witness for Jesus, to be, you know, it ought to be, an, it's just an honor that we can represent Jesus. And so if we look at it that way, then it should cause us to be very careful about how we live our life because we're representing Jesus. We're his ambassadors. We're representing Jesus in this world. 
And so people need to see that and know that because that's part of the plan that God has for us. So we've got to keep looking to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. We've got to keep looking for Jesus to come and loving his appearing as we fill our place until we join all those others from all those time frames, whatever time frame they lived in, and they served God, and they stood for the Lord. One day, all of us are going to be together. Whether it was people back in the year 200 or wherever it was, one day, all the Christians, all the believers will stand together before the Lord and be in eternity forever with the Lord. Hallelujah. We want to we want to fill our place in our days in the process of God's plan that will bring honor and glory to him. Get your songbook, if you will. And turn to page 560. We're marching somewhere tonight. We're on our way. And we want to be faithful to the Lord as we do that. Onward, Christian soldiers. We want to keep right on marching. Keep right on doing for the Lord, regardless of what else is going on around us. It's been real easy. And I know that I have said this before, that one of the sad things about I don't even like to even talk about it anymore, but once in a while it has to come up. But when I think about this COVID situation a few years ago, one of the, I think one of the discouraging things was that I fear that there were a lot of Christians and maybe a lot of churches that got their eyes off of what they were supposed to be doing and got so caught up in, in this or that and, and plus and minus and where this was true or where that was true and got so caught up and all those things that they forgot and what we're supposed to be doing. It doesn't matter whether it's COVID or whether it's something else going on or what else is going on in the world. The church has to keep on being the church. We can't get sidelined with all these things. And we allow it to happen sometimes in our own hearts and our own lives sometimes. And we can't help all the things that's involved with some of these things, but we can't allow them to get us caught off guard or, or keep us from being the church. we got to keep on marching. Amen. He didn't say stop marching when this happens or that happens or something else happens. Keep on marching. we got to do that because our place is keep on proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ regardless of what the world's doing, regardless of whether we think this way or that way or so on. And we got to keep on marching. That's our place in the process of God's plan. So let's sing about it tonight and let's dedicate ourselves to be soldiers that's going to keep on marching and filling our place in the process of God's plan until it's time to go home. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's sing it tonight, shall we? We'd like to stand. Onward, Christian soldiers. Marching as to war With the cross of Jesus Going on before Christ the royal master Leads against the foe Forward into battle See his banners go Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have tried 
we are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity, onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. Crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never Against that church prevail, we have Christ's own promise, which can never fail. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with our your voices in the triumph song. Glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages men and angels sing onward christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of jesus going on before amen now i'd like for us to turn to 282 282 Because we're marching to Zion tonight. As we march onward as soldiers, we're on our way somewhere. And we just want to be faithful. Keep on pressing on for Jesus, regardless of what else comes along. Let's keep on marching <laughs> because we know where we're going. It's going to be worth it all when we seek Christ. So let's just keep on marching tonight. Hallelujah. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. To fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Now, I want us to notice verse 3. It said, first of all, it was an encouragement 
Let our songs abound and every tear be dry because we're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through his place for us in our period of time, and he's with us. He's Emmanuel with us. We're marching through his ground right now, but we're on our way to, to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. So we want to keep on marching, keep on serving, keep on doing, because one of these days we're going to meet Jesus. Hallelujah. But until then, we want to be faithful to carry out our place. Why don't we sing that last verse again? You're doing so good. <laughs> then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Are you on your way tonight? <laughs> amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Well, Brother Danny, why don't you just dismiss us tonight in prayer? Would you do that for us? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the thank you, Jesus. to be in your presence. Hallelujah. We thank, thank you, God Jesus. For the praise and worship that went forward. Thank we you, thank Jesus. You.